Hi everyone, in this talk I'm going to talk about transient throttle conditions and how to set them up on the modular ACUs. Now this is actually the middle part of my talk on fuel modelling from PRI in 2016, but in this talk I'll be describing also where the settings are in the modular ECUs and how to set them, not just the theory. So let's discuss what happens when we have a transient throttle condition, especially when you open the throttle. We've all driven cars with aftermarket ECUs without throttle transient correction and that it drives like an absolute dog so we know that we need it but let's make sure we understand the physics of what's going on in the engine first of all so that we understand what we're trying to correct for. The other thing that we need to understand is once we understand what's happening in the engine how do we correct for it. Uh, in the fuel model talk I talked about how you can have eight different tables that all make different corrections under different circumstances but if you don't understand what each one's correcting for then it can be very difficult and it probably means that the model's not that good if we've got all these corrections. So there are three reasons why we actually need to do transient throttle correction. The first one is that measuring MAP itself is actually quite hard. The reason is that manifold pressure actually changes throughout the cycle as each cylinder does its induction stroke. So if you were to get this signal to be smooth enough to be useful by filtering it in the time domain, then it would be so slow to respond that by the time you open the throttle, there'd be a significant lag before the ECU would inject the right amount of fuel. Now, even if you do as we do and have an angle-based filter instead where you sample the manifold pressure over, say, a 120 degree window in the case of a six cylinder engine, then when you open the throttle, especially at idle where the engine's rotating very slowly, there can still be a significant delay which would be noticeable to the driver and they don't like it. Now a third method that I've heard people describe as a good thing, we don't do it and I'll explain why, is to actually measure the manifold pressure at a specific engine angle rather than averaging it over you know, the entire intake stroke. Um, this still has the same problem though because you still are left with a signal that's up to say 120 degrees old on a six cylinder engine uh, which is going to lead to a delay. So we really need a better way to actually estimate what the manifold pressure actually is in the engine so that that's fast enough to handle the transient throttle condition. Now a second problem is on port injected engines anyway is what we call wall wetting. So unfortunately when the injector delivers a certain amount of fuel not all of it goes straight into the cylinder or rotor. Some percentage of it ends up on the runner walls and then forms a little film or a, a puddle or a pool or, or whatever you want to call it. Now this fuel isn't wasted it eventually evaporates and gets drawn into the engine but it doesn't go Go in on that particular induction stroke. It happens over time. So what that means is that if you inject a certain amount of fuel, some percentage of it is going into replenishing this pool. At a wider open throttle condition compared to the idle condition, there's going to be a larger volume of fuel there in the steady state, which means that when you start to inject more fuel, some of that is actually spent filling up the pool to, to its new steady state value. So we need an estimate of how much fuel is in the pool, how much fuel needs to be in the pool, and how much additional fuel we need to inject to compensate for this. And the final problem I'm going to talk about is what I'm going to call the gulp of air problem. Now in a lot of cases you'll actually be doing the injection um, before the intake valve opens, um, closed valve injection as it, I believe it's called. Now on a four cylinder engine at any point throughout the 720 degree cycle one of the cylinders is doing an induction stroke. So that means that at any point that you choose to open the throttle one of the cylinders is doing an induction stroke that cylinder is going to get a big gulp of air, but the fuel that was injected for that intake stroke was injected based on the amount of air that was in the manifold before you open the throttle. So we need some way to chase that air down with fuel, if you know what I mean, to actually get the correct mixture in for that particular stroke. And this is called an asynchronous injection pulse. It's asynchronous because it's not related to the engine rotation. It's timed with the throttle movement. Let's talk about the first problem, which is the difficulty in measuring MAP accurately and quickly. Now, I don't know how other ECU manufacturers get around this other than by having multiple tables or fudging it in some other way. But the issue is that if you've got an engine at idle and it's drawing, say, 30 kPa of MAP, and you suddenly open the throttle so the MAP goes up to 100 kPa, then the engine's going to need more than three times the amount of fuel. So if you're still using an old MAP signal because the filtering is, you know, has that effect, then that means that you're going to need enrichment of about 200% to deal with it. And if you're making corrections of 200%, it's, it's not because your model's slightly wrong and you need 200% correction to deal with it, it's because the, actually your, your model's wrong, you're actually correcting the wrong basic variable. And if you had an accurate measurement of MAP in the first place, then it wouldn't be a problem. So the way we get around it is with something that we call MAP prediction. 
And with map prediction, we have a predicted map table, which is based on RPM and throttle position, where the entries in the table correspond to the manifold pressure that you'd expect to see at that given TPS and RPM combination. So when the ECU sees the throttle move faster than a certain rate, then the ECU takes the higher of either the predicted map value or the measured map value from the sensor for a certain amount of time. So this amount of time is called the transition time, and you can set that in the transient throttle settings. The TPS needs to open faster than the throttle sensitivity setting, which is in percent per second, and you can adjust that um, based on the actual throttle position as well. On that same page, you can actually see the current throttle rate. So if you're not comfortable thinking in terms of percent per second, you can actually wiggle the throttle pedal yourself and see what the values are so that you know um, what sort of values you need to put in that table to make them trigger. Now you can also disable map prediction entirely on the transient throttle correction page if you want to, but in that case you're probably going to have other issues with throttle transients. Now once you've done that setup then you need to set the values in the predicted map table. And the easiest way to do this is on a dyno where you can replicate those RPM and TPS combinations and fill in the manifold pressure values that you see. Now you can check that it's working correctly by doing a live log and looking at the manifold pressure against time. When you open the throttle you should see a nice step change with response to the throttle movement and the manifold pressure should kind of stay there until the actual value from the sensor catches up. Now if you see it go high and then drop down to the sensor reading then that probably means that your value in the predictor map table is too high. Then if it jumps up to the right value then comes down again then goes back up to the right value then it probably means that your transition time is too short. Normally transition times would be say 100 to 200 milliseconds. Map sensors are fairly quick, but like I said, the actual delay is not due to the sensor itself. It's actually due to the filtering that you need to apply to it to actually get a, a sensible value. Now let's talk about the fuel film phenomenon. All this I learned was from uh, Dr. Jim Cowart, I assume that's a pronunciation, video on YouTube. And there's a, a link to that in the, um, in the article version of this video. So the way we prefer to set it up is to enable the thing called use fuel film model. And in his presentation, he describes a, a method he calls X tau, where X is a percentage of fuel that ends up um, on the runner walls rather than uh, going straight into the cylinder. And tau is the uh, time constant of the evaporation of that fuel. Now we call these fuel pooling for X and evaporation time for tau to make it a bit less confusing that the fuel pooling is a percentage and it's not actually the evaporation time, it's actually a time constant with an exponential decay, but we have to do something to make it a bit easier to understand. Dr. Cowart said that on the Ford Duratec engines that he was working on, they had an X of about 30% and a time constant of about 400 milliseconds at idle. So that would mean that if an engine took say 10 milligrams of fuel at idle, then add that 10 milligrams that we inject, seven milligrams goes straight into the engine and three milligrams ends up wetting the walls. So we'll use that as an example. And we'll also assume that at wide open throttle at idle RPM, because we're not dealing with RPM changes here, we're just dealing with throttle changes, that the engine will need 40 milligrams of fuel at wide open throttle. So at idle in the steady state, if X is 30% and we need 10 milligrams to idle, then that means that out of the 10 milligrams of fuel delivered, three milligrams of that goes into the puddle, if you like, ends up on the runner walls, seven milligrams goes straight into the engine. And in that 720 degree period, three milligrams of fuel evaporates from the puddle and gets drawn into the cylinder as well. So the cylinder actually draws in 10 milligrams worth of fuel um, and the fuel puddle stays the same size. Now, if we open the throttle um, completely at idle and the engine needs 40 milligrams worth of fuel, then if we only inject 40 milligrams, then 30% of that's going to go straight onto the runner wall, so that's 12 milligrams, and so we'll end up with 28 milligrams going straight into the cylinder. Now, the amount of fuel that's evaporated in that last 720 degrees, which is based on the size that the puddle was before, is 3 milligrams, so that means that we end up with 31 milligrams actually going into the engine. So it'll be lean and you'll get a, a hiccup as you apply the throttle, which is not what we want. So for the ECU to actually deliver 40 milligrams into the engine, the ECU has to work out that three milligrams is going to come from the fuel film that we had before. So that means that we need to get another 37 milligrams into the cylinder from the injector. Now, knowing that only 70% of the fuel that we deliver from the injector is going to go straight into the engine, that means that we need to inject 37 divided by 0.7 which works out to be 53 milligrams. And the other 16 milligrams is gonna end up building up the film on the runner wall. Now in the old school system of enrichments and so on, this would correspond to an enrichment of 32%. Now this technique that Dr. Cart described, um, he says works really well for different temperatures, different rates of throttle opening, you know, going from part throttle to full throttle, 
or straight off idle to full throttle part throttle openings all that sort of thing and it also obviously because it's based on ratios it automatically compensates for different engine sizes injector sizes and so on and when i saw that i thought oh no it can't be that good and then i implemented it and it was and i thought thank you very much now i watched the entire video and i was waiting for the bit at the end where he explained how you actually calculate what x and tau need to be and i got to the end and he said you've got to do it empirically it's got to be tuned and i thought ah oh, drats but anyway i'm sorry about that but i don't make the physics so to actually set these values correctly, the first thing you should do is disable the asynchronous injection. That is, set the async gain table to zero. I'll explain asynchronous injection in a second. Now then, if it goes too rich when you first apply the throttle, then that means that your X value is too high because the ECU is injecting too much fuel to compensate for the amount that's ending up on the runner walls. Now, as I said before, Dr. Cowart said that he found values of about 30% on the Ford Durotech engines. My experience with Japanese engines is that it's less, it's about probably 15% with factory injectors. If you put on aftermarket injectors that are not matched all that well to the shape of the inlet runners, for example, a single narrow stream injector on a um, 16 valve head, then I found that that percentage is much higher. You might need X of say 40% or something like that. Now, if it goes rich first and then too lean, it probably means that your X value is too high. Now, in general, the tau, the, you know, the evaporation value decreases with RPM. In my experience, it's normally in the range of about 0.15 to 0.4 of a second. And it, yes, it does decrease with RPM. Although we give the option to change it with manifold pressure because at lower manifold pressures, that is high vacuum, um, fuel evaporates faster. I haven't found that it changes appreciably with manifold pressure yet. Now, the fuel pooling percentage, does change with coolant temperature because when the inlet manifold's cold more fuel sort of drops out of suspension and ends up condensing on the runner walls so you might find that even if an engine's got say 15 percent when it's hot um, it might be 25 or 30 percent when the engine's cold now the last topic i want to talk about is the gulp of air problem that is the fact that when you've injected the fuel that was correct for the manifold pressure when you injected it but since then you've opened the throttle and more air has gone into the cylinder the phenomenon of this is going to change with injection timing so if you inject uh, the fuel at the, the very last minute just before the inlet valve closes then you're going to need less asynchronous gain compared to if you're doing closed valve injection now the first thing to remember is that air actually moves really fast if you've got a fair bit of pressure behind it in fact, if you've got a pressure ratio then more than about two to one, then the air actually moves sonic, so at the speed of sound through the restriction. So at idle on most engines, you'd have that pressure ratio, right? Because normal idle map is say 30 kPa compared to 100 kPa outside. So if you open the throttle a small amount, then the pressure wave of the air coming in and the air itself actually moves at about the speed of sound. So the speed of sound is about 300 meters a second. So unless you've got a supercharged Lotus with you know a kilometer of inlet track between the throttle body and the inlet ports, well under a meter of distance between the throttle body and the inlet ports. So even if there was a meter, that'd still be three milliseconds for the air to get from the throttle body to the inlet ports, which is nothing, especially with an engine at idle. Now I explained the theory behind this in the introduction, so let's put some numbers to it. In the previous example, we said that the engine's gonna need 10 milligrams of fuel at idle and 40 milligrams of fuel at wide open throttle. And we'll actually need to inject 53 milligrams to get to that 40 milligrams. So in this case, once we open the throttle, we find that we've got a deficit of 43 milligrams that we need to make up. That's the 53 that the engine needs minus the 10 that we did actually deliver. So the normal way that we'd encourage you to set this up is with a setting called automatic async, which is in the transient fuel correction settings. So once you've done that, once you've enabled that, then you have an asynchronous gain map where you enter the percentage of this theoretical value that I just described a second ago, which is 43 milligrams, you know, using those numbers. And the ECU will deliver that percentage of that amount of fuel on all the primary injectors at once. So if you enter 100%, then the ECU will do an injection squared of 43 milligrams. If you enter 50%, it'll be half that and if you enter 200% it'll be double. So it's a map of RPM and coolant temperature. Normally at lower coolant temperatures you need a little bit more especially on E85 because of you know, the fuel condensation problem that I, uh, that I mentioned before. So on 
cold temperatures E85 you might need 200% something like that you know normal value for petrol or E85 at operating temperature would be more like 100% or maybe a bit less 50% 80% something like that and at higher engine speeds you need much less so the best way to set this up is to originally put the asynchronous gain to zero and then get the best result using the injection timing and the x tau method that we described before or the fuel film model and then get the last little bit done with the asynchronous injection now the above description um, should work in the majority of cases and certainly it's worked for the ones that I've found so far but if you want to set them up manually then you can do that and there are manual tables that you can use so first of all you can set the um, transient fuel modeling to be manual enrichments rather than fuel film model if you set it to manual enrichments then the x and the tau tables will disappear and you'll have manual enrichment tables instead now you have to also enable the manual enrichment table in the basic setup page this gives you three more maps enrichment time enrichment amount and enrichment multiplier the enrichment amount is your basic table which is the enrichment percentage based on rpm and throttle position so the ecu calculates a delta of this so for example if you've got a zero percent in this table at tps is zero and then 40 percent at um, a TPS value of 50% and then 50% at a TPS value of 100%. Then when you go from 0 to 50% throttle, you'll have 40% enrichment. But if you're at 50% throttle and you go all the way to 100%, you'll get an enrichment of 10%. Now the enrichment multiplier table is multiplied by the enrichment amount table. So in theory, this should all be at 100%. But you may find that at lower coolant temperatures, for example, you need a higher percentage of enrichment than at higher temperatures so for example if you wanted 20 percent more enrichment you'd put a value of 120 into this table now the final setting is the enrichment time which is the amount of time for which you get that fuel enrichment after the transient throttle condition happens now notice that you can have this in conjunction with the fuel film model if you wish to it's just that it shouldn't be necessary in theory now another table that you can set manually is the rpm rate correction table if you have the fuel film model enabled correctly then this should just happen automatically in the background and shouldn't even be an issue. But if you want to set this manually, or if you've disabled the fuel film model and you, you need it, then you can set it up in this table. The values in the table are normalized to a rate of 1000 RPM per second. So for example, if you put a value of 6% in a certain cell in this table, that means that under that condition at 1000 RPM per second, you'll have an enrichment of 6%. Similarly, at 500 RPM per second RPM rate, you'd have a 3% enrichment and at 2000 RPM per second, you would have a 12% enrichment. Now, again, this condition should be handled by the fuel film model anyway, but it's here in case you do want to set it manually. Now, there's also a manual asynchronous injection mode as well, if you want to use that. So in this case, instead of the async gain table, which is a percentage, the asynchronous manual table is in milliseconds. So it's not in milligrams or microliters or, or anything like that, which means that the table can't be reused across different engine capacities because the millisecond is going to change with the amount of fuel delivered or different injector types because that's going to change as well. Similar to the manual enrichments table, you have an RPM TPS table and an RPM coolant temperature table and the two are multiplied together. So normally you'd set the RPM coolant temp table to be 100% everywhere and then you'd adjust the milliseconds in the RPM TPS map. But you may find that at lower coolant temperatures you need a higher percentage on the RPM coolant temperature map to compensate for the fact that more of the fuel is going to end up on the runner walls even on the asynchronous squirts at lower coolant temperatures. Now in general we don't recommend using these manual modes because usually the results are too specific to one particular installation or engine configuration. So they're not rec replicable across different engines, different injector types and so on. And it also means that if you want help with it, then uh, we can't tell you what they need to look like because it's going to be different for every engine. And last thing I'd like to say is uh, please see my other videos on the fuel modeling for the steady state condition and also the injector model. So how the ECU works out how to get from a fuel mass into milliseconds for a, a complete understanding of how the ECU calculates fuel. Thank you very much.